out of the building towards the city. Father, we love that you have saved us. But Father, our heart this morning is that your love and your saving grace would start to cascade down the streets of our city. Father, we don't want to be a holy huddle, but Father, we want to be a sheep nation where the nation follows you and walks behind you. And so Father God, we now uh, release even into the atmosphere uh, from those of us who carry the Spirit of God, which is all of us, a resurrection grace in the atmosphere. And Father, I ask that there would be spontaneous salvations up and down the length of this island today, that this would be a day that there would be a turning around of lives that are broken and dying. And we just say, turn around, turn around, turn around. And just even as you are saying that, think of those in your family and friendship groups that we, uh, that you want to see saved. And I just want you to speak over them turn around it's a turn around day it's a turn around day it's a turn around day in your heart and father I thank you that you are the God of the impossible so what looks like a situation that cannot turn around you can turn it around in an instant and we speak turn around nation turn around Scotland turn around Great Britain and face your king and see his face that is for for you, not against you, that is love and has a solution to where you are. And once again, we say, turn around nation and face your king in Jesus name. Amen. Well, talking of long service to the body of Christ, Ruth with 40 plus years, I know it's, 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 it sounds like I'm calling out all the old folk today, but it's just celebration. Dad, You've pastored for, well, I'm alive for 42 years, and you pastored before I was born, so 40, you must be coming up for 45 years preaching. You've done many Easter Sunday messages, and uh, I'm sure you have something fresh to say. He actually said to me he was going to pull one he'd done before, and I think, you know, fair play if you've done 45 Easter Sundays. <laughs> But he said to me, oh, when I started to write it, there was something fresh. And he said, I couldn't preach what I'd preached years ago. So, th so this is f maybe 46 fresh Easter messages. Put your hands together and welcome Pastor John. And they said, hope is the ability to listen to the music of the future. Faith is the courage to dance to it in the present. Have you got it? Faith is the ability to listen to the music of the future. Faith is the courage to dance to it in the present. And I think that all of us here this morning, and if you know your own heart, if you know the person sitting next to you or don't know them very well, there is one thing that we can say about ourselves, and that we are people who live in hope. God has made us that way. We are people who need hope. And by nature, that is what he has made us to be. And we long and we wait and we desire for things. We hope for something, maybe a particular set of circumstances that we dream about. We hope that they will fall into place. We hope that they will come about in our lives. Somebody who is single often hopes that they will get married. And people who get married hope and dream that they will have kids. And somebody who graduates from university wants to have a job so that they can express all that they've learned in that sort of context. And yet we know, don't we as well, that days come when our hopes seem to die. 
when our hopes don't get realized and a sense of disappointment and a spirit of disappointment overcomes us and we wonder what has happened to that hope and that longing for the future. I want to unpack that a little, but I have to tell you my best resurrection story. And it concerns a woman who was looking out of the window of her house upstairs one day into the garden of her neighbor next door. And she was horrified to see that her German sheepdog shaking the life out of one of the neighbor's rabbits. And the families next door to each other had been quarreling for quite a considerable time. And she knew that this certainly wasn't going to help things and make things any better. So she runs downstairs, she grabs a broom, runs into next door's garden and pokes her German sheepdog until eventually he drops the rabbit on the ground. And the rabbit is now covered in dog saliva and really mm, doesn't look great at all. After a moment's thought, she lifts the rabbit up on the end of the broom and brings it into her house. And she dumps the lifeless body into the bath. And she turns the shower on and she cleans, cleans all the earth and the saliva and stuff off the rabbit and rolls it over and rinses it down in cold water. She decides it looks very, very dead. But she has a plan. So she gets her hair dryer and she starts to blow on the rabbit and to dry the rabbit's fur out. And using an old comb that she's found in a drawer in her bedroom, she sort of begins to groom the rabbit until it looks pretty good, you know. She's done a great work on this rabbit. And thankfully, she knows that her neighbours are away for the day. So she hops back with the rabbit over the fence into her next door neighbor's house and garden and she puts the rabbit back inside the cage and props it up. And uh, well, she was thought, I'm not going to be blamed for this at all. Now about an hour later, she hears screams coming from next door neighbor's garden and she runs outside pretending that she hasn't got any idea and knowledge of what is going on. And she calls out to her neighbor, what's happened? What's happened? And her neighbor comes running over to the fence and says, and she can see that all the blood has drained out of her neighbor's face. Our rabbit, our rabbit, she blathers out. He died two weeks ago, and we buried him in the garden, and now he's back. And he's sitting up in the hut. What manner of rabbit is this? But it wasn't really alive. It was just a fluffed up dead rabbit. And there are lots of people in our world, and there are in our neighbors even today, who are so desperate for a sense of hope and who fluff up the things of their life and make it look as though it's good, but inside they're dead. There's something that has died. And when you have lost something that you are really hoping for, then, wow, it's a great defeat and it's often a real lowering of our spirits. You know, the truth is, Okay, we're back, right, okay. <laughs> the truth is everything we hope for, everything of an earthly nature, will eventually disappoint us. Everything is going to wear out about this world, isn't it? Eventually, it will all wear out. Everything is going to give out about this world. Everything is going to fall apart about this world. It will melt down. It will just go away. And when that happens, the question that you and I will face is what is your deepest hope when that happens? What is the foundational hope of your life that you build your life on day by day? What are you going to fall back on when everything, every other thing that you've longed for becomes a disappointment. Well, I want to start this morning with an obscure story from the Old Testament. 
And as I go and retell this story this morning, and the one thing I did feel that God told me to do this morning is tell you a story. That's why I picked that illustration. But I'm going to tell you a story from the Bible. And you may think as we go through this story, what on earth has this to say about Easter and about hope? Now, if you've been here for some studies in uh, Joshua recently, you will know something of where I'm going with this story. In the very early history of the people of God, of the children of Israel, after that period when they had been wandering around the desert carrying the Ark of the Covenant, you remember, with them, they get into the Promised Land and then things start to be a struggle. And they feel that they would be so much better if they had a king. But King David hadn't yet been appointed. And Israel one day find themselves fighting against the Philistines. And they are hoping for one thing. And they are hoping that they will be able to be victorious over these Philistines. They hope for victory. So they go into battle with the Philistines. And you know what happens. They lose. And afterwards, when the generals come together and they debrief and ask what happened, what's happened to us, why weren't I hopes realized, they ask, well, where was God when we were fighting? Where was God when this battle was going on? We were actually counting on him. Why didn't he give us what we were hoping for? And that was victory. Then somebody gets the idea and says this, let's go and fight the battle with the Philistines again. Only this time, let's use our secret weapon. You know there is a Disney film about using your secret weapon. We won't go into that. But their secret weapon was the Ark of the Covenant. So they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle. Now, you, those of you who were here a few weeks ago, will know that the Ark of the Covenant was a box, and they kept some very special things in it, the manna and the rod of Aaron that, that budded, and the count of the Ten Commandments. But it was really, as we said, just a box. It was like the presence of God. And the way that they were thinking about it was that God is in a box. So if we take the box into battle, then we're taking God into battle with us and we're bound to be victorious. So they brought God in his box, as they thought, into the battle. And they felt that God would give them that victory. It would be something wonderful that they would rejoice over. The truth is that you and I can't put God in a box, can we? We can't keep him there. And you can't keep him there, and you can't restrict what he will do, either in nations, in our world, or in our lives. God is the most free person in this universe today. He's free to do whatever he will when he decides it. And whatever he decides, for your life and for my life as well, he is the one free person who has that liberty. Well, uh, when this second battle took place, another disaster took place, but it was worse than the first time. They lost in the second battle seven times more soldiers than they had in the first battle. And worst of all, the Ark of the Covenant was captured. Now, this was unthinkable to the Israelites. This is like you and me today losing the presence of God. Now, you, know, you and I know, don't we, sometimes when we don't, we haven't lost the presence of God because he's always with us. But when we have lost the felt sense of the presence of God, and when sometimes that goes on, not just for one day, but for two days, and for three days, and for three weeks, and for three months, and I have even had to help people and pray with them, and they felt that they have lost the sense of the felt sense of the presence of God for maybe a year or more than that. And you know how desperate you feel when you have lost that sense of the presence of God, when you know that. And I'm sure maybe on Good Friday, you thought again of that cry of Jesus from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What must it have been for Jesus at that moment? Not to lose his relationship to the Trinity, because the Trinity couldn't lose one of its members, could it, and be divided. 
So Jesus there must have felt a tremendous dislocation in some way from a felt sense of being at one with the Father and with the Spirit. And he cries out, my God, my God, Eli, Eli, I love that so It's even there in the Aramaic, in the actual words in our New Testament, that Jesus cried out. That sense that God was no longer with Jesus. Jesus hadn't lost his faith. We have to say that to people. Just because you don't have a sense of the felt presence of God doesn't mean that you haven't lost your, you've lost your faith. But you've lost a sense of that faith, of the felt presence of God. So this is, was like losing that sense of the presence of God for the children of Israel. And so the Philistines, when they had captured the Ark of the Covenant, took it off to a city called Ashdod. It was where they worshipped their big god. And their god in that city was the god Dagon. And the priests took the Ark of the Covenant inside and placed it next to the statue of Dagon. Then all the Philistines began to cheer because they thought that Dagon had prevailed over Yahweh, God's personal name, that Dagon had prevailed over Yahweh, the God of the Israelites. And we read that they had a great feast. They chanted their favorite chants as they used to in pagan worship in those days. And they tell their battle stories of great victory. And everybody goes home that night and it's dark. And there is no one present in Dagon's temple to see or to hear what goes on. But something in the temple happens during the night. And when the priests come in at dawn, the text in 1 Samuel 5 says, when the people of Ashdod came in early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Now the text does not tell us what the priests thought. Maybe they thought, just an, in, you know, an accident. We, we didn't get the temple, the statue of the God there right when we put it up. Maybe it was just coincidence. But they couldn't help but think suspiciously, it seems as if Dagon has bowed down to worship the God of Israel. And it looks as if the God of Israel, Yahweh, is the God of the gods. The capital G of the all the other small g gods. And Dagon is bowing down to the God who is. Wow. And so what do they do? They have to do something. Can't let something like that go on. So they dust their God off and they erect him up and they pop him back up again. All day long, on the second day, that's what the first day I've just been talking to you about, okay? Get these days in the right order. Now, on the second day, the Philistines come into the temple and they celebrate their victory again and they want to sing their songs and offer their uh, sacrifices. And then, at the end of the second day, Night comes on. The priests turn off the lights or they blow out the candles and they go home. And they leave Dagon alone with Yahweh. <laughs> and Dagon says to himself, if he could think, here we go again. <laughs> Next morning, when the priests come in, they find once more that Dagon has fallen onto the ground before the, uh, the Ark of Yahweh, the Ark of the Covenant. But not only this time, his head and his hands have been broken off and they are laid across the threshold into the temple. And all that was left of Dagon was inside, in the temple, was just a stump. Wouldn't you love to have known what happened next? But the text doesn't tell us what the Philistines' immediate reaction was. All we know, and now you've got it, I hope, that this incident is a three-day story. Okay? It is a three-day story. The first day, it was very dark. It looks like the God of Israel is defeated in battle and the glory has gone. 
In fact, there was a very poignant episode just before what happened in Dagon's temple. After they had lost the battle and the ark had been captured, the priest of Eli, or the priest, the high priest Eli, dies, and his two sons die, and his daughter-in-law, who is expecting a baby, she also dies. And when Eli's daughter-in-law, who is in childbirth, hears that Israel has lost, and they've lost the ark, the presence of God, she says she wants that her son to be born shall be called Ichabod. Now, you know that the word for glory in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word kabod, okay? And if you put an I in front of it, it makes it into a negative, the same as with the A in the front of the word theist. You know, an atheist is the opposite of a theist. And when you put an I in front of the word glory, in front of the Hebrew word Ichabod, it simply means the glory has gone. It turns it into a negative. And what I think Eli's daughter-in-law is really saying at is saying that the whole of this first part of what we know in our Bibles, the whole of what has been a revelation of God's heart for the world that he's created, for its redemption through a people, through the calling of Abraham, through the calling of the 12 tribes of Israel, that all that, that's just been a pipe dream. You know? There was a glory. Oh, we were told, the prophets told us that there was a glory, that God was revealing his glory. And he was going to do something wonderful about it. But now, because they've lost the presence of God, it's just Ichabod. We have believed the wrong thing. There is no God. There is no Yahweh. There is no glory. Life doesn't have any meaning. You're born and you die and that's it. And so my son, I think she is saying, might as well know that as he starts to grow up right from day one. He will be a realist, my son. Because she had no hope. She lost her hope. And so she gave up there, and she made, named her son the glory had defeated. The first day, heaven is often silent. There is no hope, and there is no glory. And no one often understands why. Do you know some days we have days like that, don't we? Do we better be realistic? You know, we don't all have super spiritual thoughts, do we? 24-7, all the time. And some days there are days when there seem to be little glory and it seems to be dark. And then there's the second day. And the second day is hidden in sort of combat and struggle. You know, I nearly talked to you about that wonderful verse in Peter to tell you what Jesus did between his, his death and his resurrection. Because you know what Peter says, Jesus went and preached to the spirits who were in prison, who had been disobedient in the days of Noah. Where were they? What prison were they in? Did they get a second chance? Do we get a second chance later on? Because he says they had already died. So they get another dose of something. But I thought, no, we'll leave that for another occasion. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I can't get my mind around all the details of that for you this morning. But it's interesting, isn't it? But that, that second day is often a day of struggle and combat. And when you look back on the second day, it's often a day shrouded in mystery. It's a day of ambiguity. It's a day of anxiety. Don't you have some days like that sometimes? When all those sort of feelings just overwhelm you. But then you see there comes a third day. And on the third day, the story does 180 degrees turnover. And the idol is overturned. The time of captivity is come to an end. Because the third day is always God's day. Yahweh is, in fact, the third day God. Amen. He is the third day God. Now, this kind of pattern of three days, you find in the Old Testament again and again. And often the people of God are told that they are going to have to wait 
and they appear on the second day to be really disappointed. And yet, deliverance and rescue is coming. But the three days they have to wait. And that three days is a time of anticipation. We read of a man named Joseph, and he was in prison, and he said to Pharaoh's cupbearer, one of his other prisoners there, he said, in three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and lift up your head and restore you to your old job in three days. Now, you need to remember that often the second day can be much longer than 24 hours. The second day, when God seems to be silent, can often be a lot longer than 24 hours. And when Israel was trapped in slavery, Moses asked Pharaoh, let us go for three days into the wilderness. When the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai, God said, consecrate the people, make them ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down. And on the morning of the third day, the Bible says, it came to pass. Because God is the God of the third day. Remember when Israel was threatened with genocide, there was a girl in the king's harem called Esther. And she says, in the face of this problem, I will fast for three days and then I will go into the king and seek deliverance from my people. When Jonah is swallowed up in the belly of a great fish, does anybody know or want to guess how many days he was in the belly of the fish? Three days. Okay, you're with me. The third day was so frequently used as God, by God as a sort of technical expression, meaning a time when you've been waiting for deliverance, a time when things have got messed up, a time when hope before has got crushed, when your heart has been disappointed, but you know that a better day is coming, a third day. You know, when the people of God got into the promised land, and we looked at this in Joshua 3, didn't we, recently, God said to the Israelites, don't be, or jo uh, Joshua said, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Three days from now, you will cross the River Jordan and you will go into your inheritance in the land that I has give, have given to you. The book of Hosea mentions the third day. Come, let us return to the Lord. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will rescue us that we may live in his presence. No longer a sense of death and the grave clothes hanging on our spirits, but we live on the third day in God's presence. And then one day, years and years later, Deliverance came in a way that nobody really expected it or was looking for it. And God came back to his people, but not in a box this time. This time he came as a man. And you know what John says, the word became flesh and it dwelt amongst us. And that opening of John's gospel is very, very evocative language. Just take that word dwelt and dwelt amongst us. You know that it's the word in the, in the Hebrew, uh, sorry, in the Greek, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament. It's the word in the Old Testament for tabernacle. The word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. And the tabernacle was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was. That was where they thought God resided. And now John says Jesus became flesh and he came and he tabernacled amongst us, or as the message translation says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. And then what does John, when he starts talking about the presence of God, he has to mention glory, doesn't he? And he uses the word kabod there, or in its Greek form, we beheld his glory. 
He's kabod. You can't think of the presence of God without thinking of glory. And I think when you really start reading John's Gospel, and you really get those opening verses into your spirit, you know, you, you understand them, you wrestle with the words, you wrestle with the phrases, you wrestle with, with the Greek, and you get it into your head, but then it has to go that distance 18 inches more to reach your heart, or else it just becomes an academic intellectual thing. But when it gets into your heart, it's then, I think, you pick up the great theme of John's Gospel. And you link it to glory. And the great theme, the great word in John's Gospel is the word friendship. Now you think about what Jesus said in his discourse there. He said, you are now my friends. And because you're my friends, I've shared my heart with you. I've told you all about the Father. Because you're friends. And when you think of glory, you think of friendship with God. At least I hope you do. Because that's part of the glory. That God, by grace and through Christ and through Christ's soft suffering on the cross for us, has brought us into a relationship of friendship with himself, which is glorious. That's the wonder of it. So don't rush through to chapter 16 of John. Do your work in chapter 1, and then chapter 16 will erupt with a sense of wonder that all this glory, and the glory that you've seen in Jesus when he feeds the, the 5,000 people, you know, with the two loaves and the two fishes, and the people are satisfied deeply physically satisfied. And it's just a picture of what the bread of life, the living glory bread of God does to your heart and your soul. On the third day, from the deadness of our sin sometimes, and the deadness of our reaction and our inability to feel something that we want to feel about God, we realize that all the emotion of friendship with God in Christ and all that friendship means to you and me, and all the emotional satisfaction of being in deep, meaningful friendships with people, we find in Jesus Christ. And it is a wonderful sense of glory. The story of Jesus, of course, is a three-day story, isn't it? And the followers of Jesus make the claim that this is a wonderful day. The first day, that day of Good Friday, that day of darkness, you know, where Jesus says, it is finished. Wow, you know. You know how Jesus said it? The Gospel writers, one of them tells us. Some of them say, he said with a loud voice, he cried out. And they don't tell us what it is, you know? Sometimes I like to think, John, imagine as you're reading this story from the umpteenth time, you know? Imagine you were reading it for the very first time in your life. And you read, and Jesus uttered a cry. Well, if I was reading it for the first time in life, what did he cry? Now, fortunately, I can go back to Mark's Gospel and I can find out what he did cry because Mark says he cried out, It is finished! And if you want to bless your soul today, go home and make a list of all the things that you think Jesus could have referred to by saying, It is finished. Now, obviously, his sufferings were sin. They were finished, weren't they? The Old Covenant was finished. All the sacrifices of the Old Covenant, they were done away with. The Passover was an anomaly because Jesus had offered himself. You know, I know, don't get too taken up with the celebration of the Jewish Passover. It's obsolete. It is, it's obsolete. Read Hebrews. Part of the newness of the new creation is that we have Jesus. We have friendship with Jesus in a saviour and a redeemer and a Lord. And we have entrance into the presence of God there. We feast on him. 
And so the third day is God's day. The day when the prisoners under Pharaoh got set free. Do you need a special third day? A God third day in your life this morning? Is there something from which you feel you're a prisoner? And you've been a prisoner long enough to that thing. And on the third day, God's day, prisoners get released and they're set free. And on the third day, they came to the mountain. And the Mount Sinai shook and the rivers were parted and people got into the promised land. Okay, have you known and experienced your exodus? You know what it is to come out of Egypt. But have you got into the promised land? Have you got into your inheritance? Have you made that entrance into the fullness of what God has for you on his third day in your experience of him and of his truth? The third day, the idols like Dagon came tumbling down. Because God has started being at home in your heart. You know what will happen? When God really comes to be at home in your heart, the demons and the idols fall. They have to. They can't remain standing if Jesus is Lord and King and Yahweh of your life. They fall and are smashed. And the third day is the day when the stones are rolled away. The day a crucified carpenter comes back to life. You see, you and I never know what God is going to do on the third day when he comes back. But he wants to do marvelous things in your life and in mine. So let me bring things to a close and ask you, what are you hoping for? What is your foundational hope this morning? Is it in Jesus Christ? Is it in him and in him alone? Gerard Kelly, um, some of his modern Christian poetry is really good stuff, I think. He has a way with words. But in one of his poems, he has these three lines. Because he is risen, my future is an epic novel where once it was a mere short story. I thought, wow, he's really got it there. Because Jesus is risen, my future has become an epic novel. Series after series after series after series. Not just a short story. Think about your life in those sorts of di dimensions. One thought that came to me last night as I was sort of lying in bed thinking where this sermon was going to go and it hasn't gone quite where I thought it was going to go this morning. Um, I was thinking about Mary Magdalene in the garden in John 20 and having recently seen the film of Mary uh, Magdalene and... Um, there is a, a, a most amazing book which has just come published, which Amazon delivered to thy door yesterday, I'm very pleased to say, uh, uh, on Vindicating the Vixens. Now, don't be put off by the title. It is a serious study, a very serious study book with loads and loads of footnotes. But it's a reappraisal of the women of the Bible, of about 16 of the women of the Bible, including Mary Magdalene and the woman at the well and Tamar and such like, where... Uh, great scholars, women and male scholars, have gone back to find out what does the text actually say? You know, you know we, we think of the woman at the well of Samaria, that she was, oh, she must have lived an awful life. She had five husbands and husbands she was living in. Well, you know, in, in Jewish society and culture, that day, it, it, a woman couldn't divorce a man. So it is probably, she may have had the unfortunate experience of having one husband after another die. It may not be that she was promiscuous, as you and I would think it was. And she was living with his other husband now simply because well, she, she needed protection. There was no uh, security to help, help that she could go back on. 
She had to find a man just to have security, to live and have something to eat. So maybe that was the case. And you know Bathsheba. And, 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 and when David is looking down from his, from his temple, you know, and the sense of the Hebrew word there can mean that she wasn't having a bath, as you and I th- think of the word bath, uh, we strip off completely, but maybe she was just washing her hands and her feet is the word there. So maybe she wasn't stressed, uh, 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 stripped right down naked. And maybe where they had their houses designed in those days is, is that that room would have been high ward. So maybe she wasn't showing off to David whatsoever. She didn't even know that anybody was looking. But David was the peeping Tom who was, had his palace further up the hillside and he looked and he didn't know how to deal with what he saw. And so he sends people, some of his guards. Now that gives the impression that she was not willing. She wasn't a willing participation in that relationship at the beginning. That he had to send her to, for her. So all those things are very interesting. And Tamar, you know, Tamar, and, and, and she sleeps with Judah and all, all that, wants to raise up children there. I haven't got time to tell you, but if you think of the whole Old Testament background, which is behind the book of Ruth, of Leverite marriages, of if your brother uh, dies, then you have to raise up his seed by marrying his wife, the Leverite marriage. Well, that's all behind the book of Ruth there. And, and so the, this, this book has a, a fresh appraisal. So I'm thinking in bed last night uh, about Mary. Um, uh, and, and I'm thinking... Jesus, were you in the garden all that time? Why hadn't Peter and John seen you in the garden? Now, maybe he wasn't in the garden at that time, but I have hanging up in my hallway that, that wonderful painting of John and Peter running to the tomb first thing in the morning. You've probably seen it there. Uh, uh, just how you would imagine John to be a little more delicate. And P- Peter, this great burly, burly man, And did they also miss Jesus who was in the garden? I don't know about that. Was he in the garden at the same time? And he was watching from somewhere as they entered into the tomb. And then later, there's there's Mary, and she has this conversation with Jesus. And then Jesus says to her, simply, her name, Mary, wouldn't you love to hear the one who loves you like Jesus speak your name. I thought, God, I would love to hear you speak my name. I would love to hear you speak my name. The one who has created you, the one who has redeemed you. I grabbed a piece of paper, took my pen up, thought, I need to write this down. No one speaks her name as Jesus does. No one speaks your name as Jesus does. And what happened? Her life was transformed. But what changed? Well, Pilate was still in charge, wasn't he? And Caiaphas was still the high priest, and the soldiers were still around and doing their business. But within her life, within herself, within her emotional makeup, within her heart, Jesus had called her by name and everything had changed. Let the Spirit of God witness with your spirit that you are his child. Wait, listen until the Spirit breathes to your spirit and he says your name. Whatever your name is, nobody says your name quite like Jesus says it. And that's the transforming friendship.
that begins at the tomb on the third day because we believe in a third day God. So think about your life. On this resurrection morning, what is it that God wants to do to surprise you on this day? Maybe it's just as you wait on him today, just to hear him whispering your name. Mary, John, only the way he can do it, only with the same nuance in his voice that he has and that you will know forevermore as the spirit witnesses with your spirit that you are a child of God, you will know forevermore that you are his. And maybe the other things that happened on those third days have their spiritual equivalent in your life, happy Resurrection Day to you all. Joyful Resurrection Day to you all. Life-giving Resurrection Day to you all. Spiritual life arise in you today. And let Jesus call you his friend. My friend. What do you do when you need him most? What do you do when your problems overwhelm you? You call a friend, don't you? <laughs> what about Jesus? The best friend of all. And all the glory that is around that relationship of friendship that you and I have with him through a resurrected Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. I think it's good to say out loud, thank you, Jesus, that I'm your friend. Thank you, Jesus, that I am your friend. Thank you, Jesus, that I am your friend. And just as even as we lay hands on our hearts, Father, we don't want to have you boxed in. But Yahweh, we want you to explode from our hearts and even take over all that we are. That every day gone around our being would fall to the floor and break to pieces as you explode. Father, I thank you that your victory was not just for one moment, but it was certain for eternity. And Father, I thank you that it means that I don't just have a victory at the moment of salvation, but that you are working on successive, continual victories all through my life. That God, you are working on victory in my heart. You are working on victory in my emotions. You are working in victory in my finances. You are working in victory in my relationships. You are working in victory in my education. You are working in victory in my job. You are working in victory in my family situation. You are working in victory in my ministry. You are working in victory in my business. Father, you have not stopped knocking over the Dagons. You have not stopped knocking over every false pretender to the throne. And like a bowling ball that gets a strike, so forceful is your power that every skittle stacked against me is like a small stick in your mighty par and it crumbles and it's wiped away and the score is high for victory in your kingdom. So Father, I thank you that you are sending bowling balls of victory. Over and over and over and over. And we give you all the glory. 
we give you all the glory.